Lord be with you. Did you smell that good food cooking when you came in this morning? There are brats and pulled pork. There's going to be hay rides and bounce houses today. It's going to be an awesome event for our congregation. But first, we do the good stuff first. You see, here at St. Paul, what we're all about is actually not the parties. The parties are kind of icing on the cake, but for us, the meat and the potatoes, that which we long for and desire is being here. Here in God's house where he forgives our sins, here where he gives us life and salvation, it's here today in our worship that our Lord gives us Jesus. May our God bless our worship today, fill us with lots of Jesus. Come, let us worship the Lord.
rise for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Let us pray. O oh Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have commanded us to pray and have promised to hear us. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may direct and govern our hearts in all things, that we may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> B. 
The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 32. The same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 children. And he crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. This is the word of the Lord. The epistles from 2 Timothy, chapters 3 and 4. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. 
reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. According to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you,
Jesus' name, amen. We call it a wrestle party. It takes place in the basement of the parsonage. There is wrestling, there is tackling, there is tickling. There are pillows that are thrown, stuffed animals launched across the room, even soft, squishy balls at times thrown at one another. The goal of the game is pretty simple, is to be the one on top. If you're the one on top, you declare, I'm on top, I win. The game was pretty easy when I had one. With one, I could keep her at bay, and Dad always won. But then I had two, and they come at you on both sides. But with two, I could handle two. And then I had three. There was one particular time recently when it was towards the end of the game, and I had one kid pinned, another kid on top of that one, and then Dad was on top. And just as I was about to proclaim victory, I'm on top, I win, all of a sudden, this little four-year-old screamed. She jumped off of an ottoman with reckless abandonment and landed right onto my back with this strong grip of death for a four-year-old. She wrapped her arms around my neck, and she pushed and she prodded, giving her siblings a chance to escape. It happened unexpectedly. She, she chumped me out of nowhere. And I got to tell you, it hurt just a little bit. My dear friends, the word of the Lord that engages us this morning is from that Old Testament lesson and we hear of a wrestling match between Jacob and not a four-year-old girl, but of God himself. You see, God wrestles with Jacob. God pushes Jacob down. God even hurts Jacob. He dislocates his hip. But strangest of all, at the end of our text, we're told, and God allowed Jacob to win. You know, for us to understand that, how does God wrestle with people? How does God hurt us, but then he actually he lets us win? i got to take you back. You see, we got to go back all the way to the beginning of Jacob's life because Jacob was a man who loved to wrestle. In fact, that name Jacob, it, it can mean several things, but it can mean surplanter. It can mean deceiver. It can mean trickster. It can mean crooked. And this name of Jacob really defines his life. From the very beginning, Jacob wrestled with others. He was a twin. In the womb of his mother, Rebekah, was his brother Esau. And when Esau came out first and Jacob came out second, Jacob came out grabbing on to his brother's heel. These brothers would be wrestling their whole life long. It'd be later when they're grown up Esau was out hunting for the weekend. He comes back and he is famished. He is literally starving and he tells his brother, I can't even take another step. Please, please give me some of that stew that you're cooking. And instead of helping his brother, Jacob sees this as his opportunity. Sure, brother, I'd love to help you. What's it worth to you? Anything, anything, just give me something to eat. And Jacob says, perfect. I want your, your inheritance. <clears throat> I want your birthright. I want it. And Esau, without thinking, says, fine, fine, just take it. This is Jacob, kind of an evil man. Later on, when his father Isaac is now old, and he's blind, and he thinks he's on his deathbed, he tells the oldest Esau, I want you to go, and I want you to go hunting. Find something for me to eat, prepare it for me, and then I'm going to give you the oldest son blessing." It's an extra blessing, a special gift to the oldest child. And Esau, or Jacob hears about it. Him and his mom devise a plan for Jacob to steal that blessing. And so he goes into Esau's closet, he puts on his clothes so he smells like him. And then his mom says, you know, Jacob, you're kind of smooth, but your brother's really hairy. Let's do this. And they kill a goat, and they put the goat's skin, the fur on Jacob's arms, and on the back of his neck. And then Jacob goes, and now he wrestles with his father. Isaac, who can't see, says, who, who are you, my son? And Jacob says, I am Esau. He lies. And Isaac says, well, you sound like Jacob. 
And he comes forward and says, here, Dad, touch me. And he touches the goat's skin. And he says, well, you sound like Jacob, or you, but, you, but you feel like Esau. But, but son, I just told you to go hunting. How did you make the food so quickly? And Jacob says, well, the Lord provided. He got it for me real quick. And he lies again. And Isaac blesses Jacob. Jacob leaves, and literally moments later, Esau returns. He says, Dad, I'm here. I brought your food. Bless me, Father. And the father says, oh, no. Esau gets angry. He is so mad at his brother who's always wrestling and tricking and deceiving, and he wants to kill him. And so Jacob hears, and he runs away. He runs to a foreign land, to the land of his mother, Rebekah, to go and to find his uncle, Laban. Now, you might think, after kind of ruining your situation here, that he would have a fresh start over here, that he would maybe turn a new leaf, and Jacob would now be this good person. But that's not what Jacob means. Jacob means deceiver, and that's who he continues to be. With Laban, he says, you know, you have a daughter, Rachel, who's beautiful. I want to marry her. Laban says, if you work seven years, you can have her. So after seven years on his wedding night, this time the trickster gets tricked. On the wedding night, Laban switches the sisters, and he gives Jacob Leah instead of Rachel. Laban says, son, that's not how we do it around here. The oldest daughter gets married first, and then the youngest daughter can get married. So if you want Rachel, it'll be another seven years. And Jacob says, yes. But you see the problem in this. How many wives are you supposed to have? One. And so Jacob, the man who wrestles with Esau and with Isaac, and who wrestles with Laban, now he wrestles with wives. Because having two wives and having a favorite is never a good idea. And then these sister wives, well, they have trouble getting pregnant, and they give both of their servants to Jacob to also be wives, and now the man's got four wives, and they're all fighting with one another. Jacob's life is not going very well. It's been 20 years that he's lived with Uncle Laban, and he decides it's time to finally go home. And so in the middle of the night, he tricks his father-in-law again. He takes the whole family, doesn't allow his father-in-law to kiss his daughters goodbye or say goodbye to his 11 grandchildren. Instead, Jacob leaves in the middle of the night, once again thinking about Jacob. You see, this is who Jacob is. He is self-involved, or self involved, self-obsessed, self-centered. It's all about Jacob. And as he's going on his way home, he thinks to himself, you know, last time I was home, my brother tried to kill me. I know what I'll do. I'll send some servants ahead first to kind of feel him out how he's feeling. And the servants come back and they tell Jacob, your brother Esau is coming with 400 men. Jacob gets pretty scared, and so he sends an offering ahead to him. Send him my sheep and my goats and my donkeys and my camels. Let him have them all. Then he says, I'm going to take my family. I'm going to divide them up into two groups. That way, if Esau attacks one group, I'll still have some left over. Can you imagine using your family as bait? This deceiver thinks only about himself. And then, he's almost home. He sends his family across the Javik River. And he stays on this side for the night, I'm sure, just to think things through. He's all by himself. And that's when it happens. God jumps him. It comes out of nowhere, but we're told that God comes and wrestles with Jacob for the entire night long. At first, Jacob doesn't know it's God, just some stranger. Some stranger out of the woods who's trying to hurt him. And Jacob wrestles with him all night long. And when day is about to break, and this strange man sees that he has not prevailed over Jacob, he takes his hand and he touches his hip, and his hip pops out of socket. And now Jacob's limping as he's wrestling. It's about this time where Jacob figures out who this strange man is. This isn't just some strange individual. This is God Almighty. God who has pushed Jacob down, who's wrestled with him all night long, who has dislocated his hip. And why? In order to bless Jacob. 
You see, that's how it works. God wrestles with his people in order to bless us. And it often happens unexpectedly. There are times in life where things are going great, that the family life is good, that the job life is good, the financial life is good. You're pretty happy. Have you been there? I have. When life is really a joy, things are going really good. But then there are times that it seems like like God jumped you. When everything comes crashing down, when your life falls apart into pieces, and then those pieces break into pieces, and those pieces break into pieces, and then there is nothing left. And at those times, those times it seems like they're so long that you never even remember when life used to be good. Have you been there? I've been there too. Sometimes it happens like Jacob with an injury. There's a fall. And then there's doctors, and there's surgeries, and there's physical therapists, and it seems as if you're never going to get better. And maybe you don't. Maybe like Jacob, you now have a limp, too. And you wonder, why is God doing this to you? And then there's other times. Maybe it's the kids. They're struggling at school. And maybe it's homework, but probably it's friends. They just don't seem to make friends. People are picking on them or bullying them, and they come home every single day in tears. Maybe it's even the teacher who's picking on your kid. And it is literally hell for your kids to go to school, and there's nothing you can do about it. And it just hurts. Or sometimes, like Jacob, you, the deceiver, have just made bad choices and bad decisions and you've surrounded yourself with bad friends and you have brought all of this upon yourself. And what you find at those times when it seems as if God is just giving you more than you can bear, you find yourself wringing your hands and stressed during the day and staying up all night because you just can't sleep. You're pulling your hair out and you wonder why is God pushing me down? And the answer is because God wrestles us to bless us. Jacob was a self-centered, self-absorbed, self-involved man. It was all about Jacob. And God came to push him down, to build him back up. God came to kill him, to make him alive. God came to hurt him, to make him remember who's really in charge. You see, Jacob gets a new name, and with this new name comes a new identity. Jacob, which means deceiver and crooked, now gets a new name, Israel, which means to make straight. Jacob, who is so crooked, is now made straight. And God gives him a momentum, the limp the rest of his life, to remember who he is. It's not going to be about Jacob anymore. It's going to be about Yahweh and Yahweh's plan for this family, a plan for salvation for the world. You see, in this little story of Jacob wrestling with God, it foreshadows an even greater event. You see, there will be another time, the fullness of time, when God will come God will come and he will dwell in the man, Jesus Christ. Living in this world, he will wrestle with people. From the very beginning, he wrestles with Herod, who tries to kill him in Bethlehem. He's going to wrestle with the devil for 40 days in the wilderness. He's going to wrestle with disciples who are hard to understand. He's going to wrestle with Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and all the religious leaders. He's going to wrestle with Pilate, who thinks that he's in control, and he's going to wrestle with soldiers who mock him and spit on him and put him on a cross. And it's this Jesus who wrestles with the people in this world. He allows himself to lose. We call that day Good Friday. Jesus is actually going to get nailed to a cross, and God loses. And why? So that his people might be blessed that our sins would be forgiven, that we could have life with 
Jesus. In our world today, they would tell you that the scars that you bear, you should cover those up. Whether they are physical or whether they are inside, you shouldn't let people know the pain and the suffering and the scars that you've had. You should just keep looking forward. Don't think about the past, a akuta matata. Right? Because if you let people know about your scars, it's, it's showing a sign of weakness. But did you notice how our text ended today? We're told that after God allowed Jacob to win, Jacob limped off to go and find his family. You see, Jacob had that scar that dislocated the hip the rest of his life. In fact, we're told that when Moses wrote down those words, that even in Moses' day, the people of Israel did not eat the skin from the hip because they saw it as a blessing from God. You see, these signs, these scars that God gives us, the sufferings that we endure in this life, they are symbols of God's love for us. God tears us down to build us back up. He kills our sins to make us alive in Christ, and he gives us new names too. We're called Christians. Those who belong to Christ, those who win with Jesus. Just as Jesus has his scars in his hands and his feet and his side for forevermore as signs of God's love, so the suffering that we endure in this world are signs of a God who wrestles with his people in order to bless us. God is the ultimate wrestler, and he comes and he jumps us at unexpected times, and at times that hurts. But he comes and engages us to call us back to himself, that we could have new names, that we could live in his kingdom, that he could bless us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And we rise. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. After hearing God's word, we make bold our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers uh, for, for this Sunday, a few others we keep on our prayer list. Uh, Pat List, who we prayed for last week, had gone home, and she is now back in the hospital. Uh, we pray for strength and healing for her. Uh, we also keep in our prayers the Meyer family, as Gene Meyer's father was called home to life and salvation. We pray for hope and trust in our risen Lord. We also rejoice uh, in all marriages in our congregation, but especially for a 50th anniversary for Bruce and Anita Seehausen. Uh, what a wonderful testimony of God's love for us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord has urged us to be per persistent in prayer on behalf of ourselves and all people as they have need, and he has power to answer. So let us pray to our Lord. Almighty God, your Son encouraged us to be diligent in prayer, and Paul called on us to pray without ceasing. Hear the prayers of your people for the sake of your Son, and grant your blessing to all who come before you on bended knee. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, you have promised to protect, defend, and prosper your church through your word. Give us wise and faithful pastors who will preach your word without constraint and open our ears and hearts to hear and believe it. 
Bless us with faithful church workers and bless those now preparing for your service. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you hold accountable all those who govern and lead your people. Bless, guide, and instruct our president, Congress, governor, and all in authority that they govern according to your will and purpose for the cause of peace among the nations, for the common good of all, for our protection against our enemies, and for the promotion of virtue and the punishment of evil. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your word is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. Bless those who gather to teach and learn your word, especially our Sunday school, catechism classes, and Bible studies, that we show ourselves wise and faithful sons and daughters who delight in your word and walk in your ways. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you carry the burdens of us all in your Son, who is wounded for our transgressions. Deliver the sick from illness, the suffering from their pain, the troubled from their distress, and the dying from fear. Give us courage and strength in our afflictions, that we trust in your promise and await your promised healing with patience. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have promised never to abandon your children. Give us such confidence in your gracious will that we do not abandon you in times of test, grow weary when hope is tried, or listen with itching ears to the false voices who would entice us. Help us always and in all things to hold on to your promises with joy and thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, you know our frailty and our weakness, that we do not always know how to pray or what to pray for. So grant us all things good and profitable for our salvation. Deliver from us all things harmful, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom all glory, honor, and worship are yours, Holy Father, in the unity of the Son, now and forever. Amen.
we rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, in your kingdom and teach us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night to which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also to the cup after supper. And when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We greet one another the peace of the Lord.
eyes. And now may the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. <laughs> to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. be seated for just a moment. It is October, and that means coming up soon is, uh, not Halloween, Reformation. That's what we celebrate here in the church. Uh, I have in the back tables some books about the Reformation. 
If you've been wondering about Martin Luther, if you're looking for a comic book, I got one of those back there too. Uh, that might be something to take a look at. I, I got those uh, to bless your families. Uh, please take a look at those. Um, let's see, next week we have our trunk or treat. Uh, here's what I've been told we still need. I need a few more cars to sign up. I got 11 cars, and my group tells me we probably need 20 cars. So if you've been on the fence, sign up today. We'd love for you to participate in our trunk or treat. Also, if you just can't decorate a car or don't want to, uh, we're also looking for candy. If you'd be willing to bring in a bag of candy, you can bring that in during the week or bring it next Sunday. Uh, but thank you for trying to make that event a success. When we had this event, you, you kind of got to go back because of COVID, three years ago, we had over 500 kids here. It, it was awesome. And so if you'd be willing to help us, this is a great way to get people on our campus that they know St. Paul is a place that cares about families. Today, then, is our big part of the Oktoberfest. I've been told there are wagon rides. There are games outside for kids. And I've been told if you can't make it to Oktoberfest, they actually have some pulled pork out here in the narthex uh, for you on your way out. If you'd like to get some of that, uh, that'll be a blessing for you this week, I'm sure. May our Lord bless you then this week in the midst of all of your scars. I know I have many. That these can be tokens of God's love as he wrestles us down, as he gives to us Jesus, that we might win with him. Have a blessed week in the Lord. Thank you.